Hey everyone, Dana Raid here. Today, we'll be doing a super ultimate challenge run of Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. The original game isn't hard if you know what you're doing. However, we're about to change that with some code that doubles all enemies' health and attack. This creates some extremely hard situations you won't want to miss. Also, this is definitely a different type of video. I've been doing a lot of traveling and I'm also prepping for a big video coming up here in July. So if you like this style, I'll consider making more like this and shaking it up every so often. Now with that out of the way, allow me to set the stage. Story-wise, Princess Peach found a map leading to an ancient treasure. By the time you get to the crusty old town known as Rogueport, she's gone missing, and this is starting to sound a lot like every other Mario game. Mario quickly arrives to find Lord Crump, one of the primary leaders of a secret society known as the x -Nots. He's bugging a girl Goomba, and it seems to me the design department decided it would be funny if they just switched the genders of Mario's Goomba partner. We talk to some old-timer who looks like he spends his nights watching Dateline and Jeopardy, and we find out that the magical map found by Princess Peach leads to the seven crystal stars, which is the key to opening up the thousand-year door. You probably could have guessed some of that because of something called a subtitle. We encounter our first enemies on our way to the Thousand Year Door in the Rogueport sewers. Oh no! We have to talk about the whole reason why I'm making this video! The Goombas here typically have two health, which would take one jump or hammer attack to knock them out. But with double health, now it takes two stomps or wax to knock each one out. This is nuts! This wouldn't be a big deal, and I probably wouldn't even point it all out if it weren't for the fact that I died. I'd like to point out that this playthrough has only lasted about 10 minutes, and most of that 10 minutes was sitting through the dialogue of Mr. Jeopardy talking. The Super Guard is a mechanic I utilize to beat these guys that'll eventually become super important later. A regular guard is achieved by pressing the A button right around when the enemy attacks and absorbing some of the damage. A Super Guard has much stricter timing. It's about a three frame window to get it right, but if successfully done, you counter and take in no damage. This will become necessary later in the game, especially when bosses do crazy amounts of damage. On our way to begin chapter one, we encounter our first mini boss, creatively titled Blooper. This mini boss isn't super hard, but with such little health and options, we have to kill it fast enough before it chips enough damage to kill us. Earlier, we found and equipped the Power Hammer Badge, allowing us to use a more powerful hammer attack for some FP. This will allow us to defeat the blooper faster. And sooner than we know it, the blooper goes down and we can officially start our adventure with chapter one. Chapter 1 starts off with arriving at Petalburg, and before we can even stop to think, boom, dragon, oh shit! I hope you like looking at footage of battling lots and lots of Goombas, but these are special Goombas since they have double health! In finding a way into the dragon's castle, we encounter our first Koopa Troopa. These guys work a little differently with having some defense because of their shell. Knocking them over eliminates such defense. From there, fighting these guys becomes pretty smooth sailing. The main thing to remember is that we are generally more fragile, so enemies aren't too bad right now. But continuous battles back to back pose an initial threat. We participated in a game show and I won because why? Why wouldn't I? They wouldn't call me Salt and Danerade if I wasn't a winner. Down in the sewers, we encounter Fuzzies. These guys will stick to Mario or Goombella and suck health out of them. The super guard timing here isn't too bad, but the timing can feel awkward because of how long they stay on Mario. This will culminate in a battle against a Gold Fuzzy, which doesn't seem that bad considering it's just a beefed up fuzzy. Jesus Christ! We're only a little outclassed numbers wise. Oh, and Goombella's dead. We got through the fight, but Power Hammer really got us through. More battles through the forest. Koopa Troopa partner, I guess. All you need to know is that he has a simping issue with this one. So once we put in Sun and Moon pieces, which we needed because um, it's convenient for the plot, we get access to the Dragon's Castle. More Koopas, and Koops found his dead dad. Oh, never mind. Awkward! Note to self, 
If you interact with a shaking red skeleton, that probably indicates our first mini boss. Red Bones is our first real challenge, and boy, were the developers feeling really creative on the first one, just doing a little color swap. Red Bones will return to life if other enemies are still up and he's still around. I brought a pow block, which immediately knocked out all the dull bones around him. He has a tendency to make new dull bones, which helps us out as it doesn't attack us, and oh, he killed Goombella. That's what I mean by he is a threat. I died a couple of times to Red Bones. There's a little bit of luck with him throwing his bone at whoever he feels like, but he eventually dies. Dead, just like Fall Guys O. Oh. The rest of the castle consists of the same enemies we've been fighting. Lots of doll bones, Goombas, and Koopas. There's a lot of puzzle solving, leveling up, pretty standard RPG stuff. Earlier while exploring, we found a badge called Attack FXR, and I swear I found it, but for some reason I don't have any footage of finding it. The badge is important for Chapter 1's final boss, the dragon that's been teased throughout the chapter. Hooktail is its name, by the way. Enabling the badge makes this boss way easier, as Hooktail will become weaker as the battle goes on, doing less and less damage to us. Early on, though, Hooktail's attacks do heavy damage. Power Bounce is a key badge that'll be used throughout this whole run, allowing us to speedily knock down her health faster. It allows us to jump multiple times on a target and can just shred through enemies. So you beat Hooktail, she does some very generic, wait, oh, I've changed for the better, and when all is said and done, she gets off the stage and eats the crowd, what the hell? Part two of this battle is basically the same, with Hooktail gaining some of her health back. It's more of just a final push, and just like that, Hooktail goes down for real. Coops' dad just decides he's not actually dead. Coops asks, oh dad, where have you been this whole time? It's all right that our youth is becoming dumber with each generation. And just like that, Coops' once thought dead dad grants us the first crystal star. So chapter one, I mean it was pretty chill, enemies just took a little longer to kill. We swiftly transition to what's been happening with Princess Peach. The game jumps around in point of view, which I'd normally skip, but the story will get confusing later on if we don't introduce some faces to the equation. Meet the main antagonist, and who we're in an arms race with to collect all the crystal stars, Grotus. He is the leader of the x Knots, a sort of secret society or cult. I don't know, but I do know that they wear funny clothing. So Peach accidentally reveals that she knows Mario. Thanks a lot, damsel in distress. Grotus talks about his plan. Pretty cool, I guess. Peach does a little wandering to find a supercomputer named Tech, who's having a bit of a simping problem with Peach. Man, this is just a reoccurring theme, isn't it? Peach talks Tech into being able to send emails to Mario. Cool, the Peach section is now done. What am I up to? Kami Koopa informs Bowser that Mario's off to find the crystal stars and that someone captured Peach, which annoys him because I guess only ugly turtles are allowed to do that. So he's off to get in on all the fun and sets sail. And that's chapter one, a hip hip hooray! Chapter 2 sees us back in the sewers as we see this little slug-like creature run away at the onset of seeing us. For simplicity's sake, we'll call all these guys the Craig species. So one of the Craigs here explained that the x knots have taken over his home, which is a giant tree. We agree to help him because, you know, Crystal Star is there. It's convenient for the plot to progress. He gives us his actual name, Punio. Nah, I'm still gonna call them all Craig. And so we enter into the pipe that leads to Bogley Woods, the setting of the second chapter. The set pieces here are cool, with the black and white trees and bushes contrasting against the colorful floor patterns. We find ourselves eavesdropping on the Shadow Sirens, one of Grotus's many henchmen to foil our plans in grabbing the crystal stars. We can walk right past them because they don't know we're Mario. Whatever, dramatic irony, you should know what that means from your 10th grade English teacher. All right, enemy analysis time. The pale piranha plants and clefts with their spikes makes jumping on them useless. The power smash badge once again comes in handy. Clefts in particular are deceptively easy, as despite their super high defense, super guarding them is really easy. The main thing to keep in mind is that regular enemies now simply are becoming more complex than the Goombas and Koopas of the last chapter. Still not too bad, there's just more strategy required so you aren't dying 
killing every other encounter. We meet up with Craig, and the x knots have installed a door blocking the entrance. This prompts us to visit Madame Fleury, as supposedly she can help us, though uh-oh, she can't go out without her necklace because egad, going out without looking like a perfect 10 out of 10 is quite awful. First world problems, Mrs. Fictional Video Game Character. Now the necklace is with the Shadow Sirens, where one of the members, Vivian, picked it up. Funnily enough, the Shadow Sirens now realize that the mustache man that walked by them earlier was Mario. You know, the person they're trying to stop. More battles are trying to not die. Awkward! Our second mini boss of the game is if you exclude the blooper, the Shadow Sirens presents us with a similar problem to Red Bones, with having multiple enemies to deal with. Problem this time being that unlike the Dull Bones that all had low amounts of health, all three Shadow Sirens have pretty substantial health. Vivian is pretty easy to deal with, Marilyn tends to charge and increase her attack power, and Beldum uses magic to make us weaker and her sister stronger. It's a tricky fight with each sister's different properties. Marilyn's lightning attack is the biggest issue, coming in at four damage to both partners, which is why in the winning run, taking her out first was part of the winning strategy. The other way to win this battle, which was a constant throughout this run, is a lot of healing using the sweet treat ability from the crystal stars. As we collect crystal stars, each one nets us a new special ability. The sweet treat ability is the first one and is like a a combination of all of them that comes from the treasure map, if that makes sense. It probably doesn't, but whatever. I'm not an RPG guy. Power Bounce and Goombella's Multi Bonk, which is basically the same as Power Bounce, easily takes out Vivian and Beldum, and that's how the Shadow Sirens go down. More great enemies. Sex appeal? That's a Calvinistic doctrine reference for the two people that watch that. Madame Fleury joins our team as the third partner, and she will become essential for the rest of this run. We travel back to the Bogley Tree, and some funny looking dudes are in our way. The x knots utilize different spells on one another to give themselves different statuses. They don't pose much of a threat this early in the game for now, though. So Craig gets some of his other Craig buddies to trust Mario because what can be scarier than an overweight Italian plumber? The rest of the tree is filled with familiar enemies and new ones such as the Piter. Piters switch back and forth what elevation they're at through the string they're on, and boy do these guys take the cake for some of the most annoying enemies. Though when you get the timing down, super guarding their attacks can make them a much more manageable threat. It's them in combination with enemies like the Piranha plants, just the sheer volume of enemies, up to four at a time, makes certain encounters way closer than they should be. So with three partners, we can absorb more damage at the cost of sometimes killing our pals. We get trapped by Lord Crump, freaking scoundrel! Lots of puzzles. This part of the game is a little dry. When we get out and find the coveted crystal star, what the hell? Lord Crump takes it and sets off a bomb. Cool. Escaping isn't hard, though I think it's funny that when you battle, the timer just passively continues to tick down. This chapter's boss is Magnus Von Grapple, a name that might be stupider than quitting lore around Woodrow Wilson. Oh, this boss isn't very hard, even with the buff stats. It's still a lot of power bounce and multi bonk, which are core staples throughout this entire run, and I swear I've said that like four times already. His stomp attack is pretty hard to guard because he does the stupid eeny meeny miny mo sort of choosing pattern. He'll shoot out his arms, which turns into rockets because, sure. They do a lot of damage, but have low health, so it's fine. He starts aggressively pounding the floor and there's sand looking particles that come down look I don't know what that's supposed to mean and the timing to block it is entirely vague to me with a couple more power bounces Magnus von Grapple goes down pretty easily. Honestly, chapter two didn't really prove much of a challenge. If anything, the mini boss was probably the hardest part. Enter clean transition here. Back with Grotus now, he finds out that Mr. Jumpman Mario has been kicking some ass down in Bogley Woods and he gets pretty mad. Peach dances with herself, what the hell is this game? Back with Bowser, he stops by Petalburg as Peach has supposedly been spotted. The running joke is that Bowser stops by the world previous to the one we completed, and it's pretty fun and cute seeing the dialogue between him and Cammy, but it's pretty trivial for now. On to chapter three. 
Chapter 3 is my personal favorite chapter, revolving around the Glitz Pit, an arena environment. The Fable Champion, known as Rockhawk, possesses the Crystal Star on his belt. And please put a funny photo of Chuck Norris on the screen, Dana Raid. Goombella states that we should fight our way to the top to beat Rockhawk and claim the belt with the Crystal Star for ourselves. I feel like it would be easier just to get a crowbar and break in, but you know what? I can settle for this. It's convenient for the purpose of the plot. We enter as a fighter in the minor league, and a big gimmick of this chapter is having to complete each battle with a sort of clear condition, and some of them can definitely make this run harder. I won't go over every fight, like, oh look guys, we're fighting the Goomba Bros. Please tell me more, Dana Raid. After our first fight, we meet up with some of the other rookies, such as the fan favorite, King K. I went against King K and he sucks! Rank 15, the Spike Storm, presents us with an exciting challenge. We have yet to go against Lakitu's and Spinies, and with the clear condition consisting of us not using our hammer, yeah, that's not good. The way to get around most of these annoying clear conditions is that our partners have plenty of tools to deal with threats like this. Now, the answer for this fight comes through the Crystal Stars, specifically the first one we got, the Earth Tremor ability. The nice thing about Earth Tremor is that it bypasses all defense and can get high up enemies, making this fight pretty easy. Now as a shake up to the regular battles, there is an ongoing and cryptic story about the inner workings of the arena. You know, typical political stuff. Amid Rockhawk absorbing all of his fame, we save an unhatched egg from being eaten. PETA would approve of this storyline. The hand it overs are next, and we utilize both the clock out ability of the green crystal star, which I find to be underrated. It can stun enemies, and boy when there's a lot of them like here, it can be an effortless way to control the battle. And remember a while ago when I said Flurry would become pretty important? Well, that's all mainly because of one of our abilities, Gale Force. If done successfully, the enemies just Bye bye! Now this isn't guaranteed to work, and the chances of working against harder enemies decrease, but boy I will be milking this till the cows come home. That was a bad pun! The bob -omb squad? Ch -ch bang him out of here! The Armored Harriers is this chapter's mini-boss, and I lost. You're actually supposed to lose because supposedly they have unknown defense, which is a troll way to say infinite defense. We return to the locker room only to find that our egg friend has hatched into a baby Yoshi, which we can name. And seeing as though this name is used for the rest of the game, I try to come up with the most repulsive name possible. Oh, I got it. We go back in the ring and boy do they hit like a truck. Dang it! Okay, I won this time and in doing so, we advance to the Major League, aha! Going forward, Super Guarding will save us. Enemies such as the first Major League match against the Tiny Spinies being able to super guard just allows us to simply survive. We find Miss Jolene figuring out that some funny business has been going on. Very suspicious. Who is Jolene? I won't tell you, but what I will tell you is that she's a toad with an actual personality and different look. Take that color splash. We fight against some colorful looking fuzzies. I'm not gonna bother explaining them because yup, someone brought us a piece of cake and uh, yep, that looks poisonous, no thank you. Rank number five, the Dark Craw has a funny trick up his sleeve. He one shots us. How do we deal with such a tough enemy? Yep, that works. But just you wait because all of a sudden, Bowser comes onto the stage and is like, bro, Mario, fight. Now, Bowser's a little tricky here as we can't Kale Force our way out of this one. Bowser also has a couple of attacks at his disposal, a bite, fire, he's got a toolbox full of goodies. What's really made this encounter unique is that a stage object made me confused and then one fell on Bowser and made him confused, so were even Steven. There's a lot of partner switching and healing, a couple of Bowser's attacks are enough to knock them out individually. Power Smash is our savior for this matchup, which is how Bowser goes down. Rank 3, Hama, Bama, and Flare pose the greatest challenge yet. As with three of them, man do they do an excellent job of taking me out. The combination of the high health and a bit of defense makes taking them all out a chore. Gale Force isn't fun 
one just to win with every time. So he used Clock Out just to give me some time to get some damage off them. And that's how we finish them cleanly. We come back and oops, someone ate the cake. He's fine. Okay. Great. Someone's out to try to kill us. What's next? Red Chain Chomps? It's Red Chain Chomps. Viddy, you're great. The final challenger before Mr. Rockhawk is a Dark Koopa Troll. And boy, is this guy tough. 50 health, does 10 attack. Yeah, Quick Hammer still works pretty well. We do some more snooping around to find... Ruh -roh. Something's fishy. The guard leads us to our championship match against Rockhawk and okay, this isn't funny. We escape. I'm telling you, the crowbar to steal the crystal star should have been the move. We make it to our championship match and it was Rockhawk who tried to poison us. The final boss of chapter three being Mr. Rockhawk isn't too crazy. He moves quite fast, which makes super guarding him a challenge and he does have pretty high attack. Clock out worked surprisingly well. I might have just got unlucky considering clock out is supposedly to rarely work on bosses that combined with a lot of multi bonk and power bounce leads to a swift victory we become the new champion and still like don't have the crystal star nice job guys we sneak into an office to find blueprints detailing a machine that can suck people's life out under the arena powered by the crystal star uh oh the manager of the arena grubba just does that and the true final boss of chapter 3 starts now macho grubba has a handful of abilities that differentiates himself from the others he can give himself certain abilities like being able to attack more than once that's cool ouch he can give himself anything in the book defense attack dodgy extra defense hurts the most as boy does he become hard to kill with that but with enough persistence he's done so this was an enjoyable chapter so we're beginning to see regular enemies pose more of a threat with their steadily increasing health and particularly high attack power all right that's all cool what's grotus been up to he talks to the shadow sirens cool tech gets peach to dress up as an x knot and talks to grotus to find out they want to rule the world Cool. Bowser goes to the Bogley tree and Cammy nearly has a heart attack. Cool. Chapter four. <laughs> Chapter four takes place in the dreary and depressing Twilight Town. In this town, when the bell goes off, someone randomly turns into a pig. When talking to the town's folks, we find out that some creature has taken over a creepy steeple and put a curse on the town. So it's up to us to figure out what's going on and save Twilight Town. Get ready for the Hyper Goombas, which will charge up to boost their attack power by six. Hello, nurse. Another main enemy in this chapter is the Crazy Daisy, which can put us to sleep. The alternate version of the Crazy Daisy is the Gold variant or the Amazy Daisy. When arriving to Creepy Steeple, we fall into a well that houses a buzzy beetles. Goombella says it best, quote, it's kind of cute. They're pretty easy to take out. Just a quick quake hammer away from death. However, one of the developers said, I have an idea. When entering Creepy Steeples' depths, we accidentally release a whole batch of boos. Wouldn't be the first brother to do so. The boo asks us a math question. We get it right and calls us a nerd. I'm only slightly pissed off. Up the stairs, we go to find this. A bed sheet? Meet the mystery man. What is this, a little WD Gaster action up in here? Uh, sure. So Gaster tells us that, yeah, he was the one that turned everyone into pigs. And so Gaster gets pretty mad at slightly insulting him and his pranks. And yep, okay, I guess we're heading straight into this. Gaster is a pretty underwhelming fight, even with increased health and attack. His ghostly fly toward us is really easy to super guard. Even when he turns the tables and becomes a Mario clone, I mean, you know what his attacks are. He attacks just like Mario. And just like that, Gaster or whatever his name is, goes down, completing chapter four. What's going on with Grotus? Oh, you've got to be kidding me. And off we go to get back our friends and literally everything else around us. Famous Shadow Siren sister Vivian decides to join our party because she's having some family issues right now. The key to the rest of the chapter is figuring out Gaster's real name. So back up to the creepy steeple, we go to eavesdrop on a parrot who is just so dumb, name dropping Gasser's real name to be 
Tuplis. In addition, we collect one of the letters missing from his name, P, which might I add, thank you localization team for this epic translation. You got a, the letter P. So we go back to Tuplis and tell him that we know his name as he runs back to Creepy Steeple. <sighs> Did I mention there's a lot of backtracking in this chapter? At the top of Creepy Steeple, we meet up with good old Dupless, who has taken all of our partners into hostage. Oh, fantastic. Oh, and then we tell Vivian that we're actually Mario, which if you'll remember, the Shadow Sirens are after us. So, uh, surprise. Vivian decided to ditch us because people who ditch are a bit. After fighting for like one turn, Vivian decides to come back. Nice. So unlike most bosses, with Duplis having our partners, he can kill us much faster than most. What still makes this fight pretty manageable is that all of Duplis's, really Mario's attacks, are easily choreographed. So this is probably the easiest boss fight to perform super guards. And just like that, Duplis goes down and we get our body back. Vivian decides to officially, for real this time, join our party. So I'll repeat it, and for real this time, What's happening with Grotus? An ex not informs Grotus that the seal of the Thousand Year Door is weakening. Yeah, I mean, it's about it. Tech gives Peach a little quiz, which is a really unsubtle way to tell Peach, hey, there's some old demon trapped behind the Thousand Year Door and Grotus wants to harness its power. Message to Mario, question mark? Bowser and Cammy try getting on the blimp to the Glitz Pit, which is weird because Bowser was already up there, whatever. We also learned that either the Koopa Clown car is really fuel inefficient or someone forgot to refuel it. Either way, oops. Chapter five. We return to Mr. Jeopardy's house and tell him what Peach has learned, that the treasure is an ancient demon. Mr. Dateline seems to have an aneurysm at the thought of a demon being the treasure, and he tells us that the monster created the crystal stars, and the crystal stars can both seal and awaken this creature. Really? I will create something that both gives me life and is yet my weakness, says the monster. The next crystal star is located on Keelhaul Key, and to get there, Mario and friends peacefully ask fellow rogue port sailor Flavio to lend them their vessel. Flavio agrees, but only if he can keep all the treasure protected by Cortez. Who is Cortez? Meh. Beats me. The problem is that there is no captain to lead the ship, and if you think Flavio will lead us, then <laughs> We go up to an old sea captain named Admiral Bobbery, and he tells us, no. We go to the bartender in town, and he gives us a note Bobbery's wife had written for him before she passed. And I know I usually skip the specifics, but man, is this an impactful and sad moment. I know it's a clever way of hiding what is essentially a fetch quest, but man, is it something I never mind doing every time. After Bobbery has a little manly man moment to himself, he agrees to head the ship, and off we are to Keelhaul Key. Oh yeah, we're also secretly being infiltrated by the x knots Whoops! We travel day and night, we experience the great joys of traveling by sea. That is, until Cortez's crew wrecks the fun and yep, we're sinking now. We wash up on the shore, alive, and perfectly fine. Cool. I love Mario games. Flavio gets into an argument with one of the sailors. Cool, here's sentient blue fire now. They do a lot of damage, which is not fun, but you know what? The big boob lady will help me out. Going deeper into the forest, there isn't anything that interesting. Multicolored fuzzies, a new piranha plant variant that spits up poison. That's not cool. Super guarding in these battles becomes more and more necessary as a couple of hits from these enemies instantly kills us. We enter a cave as we encounter sentient orange fire and they do more damage which is stupid because blue fire is hotter than orange fire so like come on nintendo thankfully Viddy does a nice job handling them if you want to talk about funny enemies then look no further than the bulky bob -oms. traveling through the caves consists of lots of twists and turns lots of traps and puzzles all in an attempt to find the crystal star that captain cortez is holding more fire and more fire yes they use these enemies a lot down here, which is kind of weird. And we finally get to Cortez's ship. Spoiler alert, he looks like a gaster blaster. It's summer, you know. The grass is green, and the trees are flourishing. The sunshine is through the roof. But with all this life, all this rose,
darkness from the depths of compassion. Though, there's a reason I quickly sped through this chapter so far because, oh my god. Cortez decided to pick up the pace from the easy fight against Duplis and take it up three notches. Everything up to this point, sure. There have been some obstacles, but it's been manageable for the most part. This fight is long and hard, and here's why. Just looking at him, you're probably thinking, whoa, he's got a lot of tools at his disposal. Like, Literally. Just look at all those weapons. His one defense point makes using multi-bonk and power bounds much harder, just drags this fight out. His attacks are hard to guard against because he's vague and visually choreographing them. He'll almost hesitate as he then quickly attacks. The hesitation makes it hard to predict. But with 120 health, it's not very hard to take him out. But that doesn't account for phase 2! Yes, this boss has multiple phases, and in the process, completely heals himself back to 120. In phase 2, Cortez ramps it up with being able to increase his attack power by 4, and having a devastating bone attack which can absolutely cause issues. I survived off the skin of my teeth! Defeating Cortez again causes- oh yep, he's got a phase 3 as well. Phase 3 as well, yup. Cortez again, except he just gave his weapons life. By now, each individual phase isn't too bad, but the longer the fight goes on, the harder it is to stay alive with depleting healing items. The weapons can thankfully be taken care of by Flurry, but that still leaves big bad Cortez to deal with. His attacks are mostly just bites, but boy does that not mean it's just as harmful to deal with. Though it is more predictable, so super guarding is manageable. After a certain point, Cortez gets bored and decides to eat half the audio and heals even more, Jesus Christ. The winning run had a fair bit of luck, with a couple of bingos bringing back the audience while also lending a nice boost to some of my stats. The issue with this fight is how long it lasts and how varied the fight is. In no part is this fight a snooze fest. This was one that took many attempts to get right. After defeating Cortez, he admits he can't actually die. After some slick negotiating, he just gives us the crystal star. That's fantastic. Now the chapter isn't technically over as Lord Crump attacks and reveals that the guy who kind of looked like Lord Crump, it was Lord Crump. We awkwardly ask Cortez if we can borrow his ship. Yes? Fantastic. Attack time. So right after the hardest boss fight, we have the mini boss of this chapter. After the boss, that's cool. Mr. Lord Crump decided to take inspiration from the Cortez fight as this mini boss also has three phases. The fight focuses on the x knots and using them in massive quantities. Lord Crump's only attack is the same as in the tutorial and is extremely easy to counter. The x knots first stack on top of each other and act as a meat shield. I don't really know what the plan is. Next, they all hang on a girder and good luck super guarding all of them at once. The final phase is by far the worst. Lord Crump decides it's cool to heal and replenish all of his health, and the x knots are used in a ball attack. And they hit like a truck! The only reason I won this fight was an attack power boost from Power Lift, that's one of the Crystal Star abilities, and then by pure chance, an attack power increase from Murley. Murley is a character that, on rare occasions, may give you boosts, such as an additional attack or defense. With so much attack power, Lord Crump's health just absolutely disappeared. Haha! <laughs> Fantastic. Let's see what Grotus is up to. Not happy, I'm sure. He gets mad at Lord Crump, and understandably so. With Peach, Tech somehow convinces Peach to sneak into Grotus's office. To do so, we have to make an invisible potion, and Tech says we have to take off our dress. This is getting messed up because that means dress is a... Uh, not clothe, hee <laughs> hee. So Tech keeps us on the edge of our seats on what the data held in Grotus's office is. Now with Bowser, he somehow gets into a war with Lord Crump and they all die and explode. The end. Chapter 6. Chapter 6 is weird to explain because there's a real lack of emphasis on actual fighting. The basic idea is that mysteries are happening on this train, and mysteries are spooky, which means this train is obviously haunted. While I could go through and explain all the little plot details, it's less important, which is why this will be a pretty short chapter to explain. The train stops at a certain point because the bridge is unconnected and we can't enter. The train station is where we have some actual fighting in this chapter. The enemies here aren't too annoying. 
We have more variations of the cloud guys, some new pokies, they're all simple to deal with, even with the increased health and attack. At the end, we encounter a new species, the Smorgs. They don't attack us, but they were blocking the button that pulled down the drawbridge. So it's back on the train we go, and whoa, it's those Smorgs again. I don't know about you, but this looks a lot like a boss fight to me. This is Smorg, which is comprised of hundreds of Smorgs. Nice terminology, guys. The Smorg has giant tentacle-like arms arms, which we must take out first before attacking the center. The arms' health isn't an issue, but boy do they hit hard. And when you do attack them all, you only get one turn to attack the main boss, the center of it all. The key is power lift, as we'll be able to maximize our damage output. This boss is a lot easier to explain away, unlike Cortez. The fight doesn't really change as it goes on, and the smorg just dies. After defeating the big baddie, we arrive at Poshley Heights to get the next crystal star, and oops, it looks like the Shadow Sirens took it first, and I guess they asked Duplis to join along? Mr. Sherlock Holmes wannabe tells us that they stole a fake crystal star, and the real crystal star is hidden. What he's referring to is entering the painting to find, that's a lot of purple booze, and just like that, chapter 6 comes to a pretty easy end. With that being said, let's check on our silly villains. Grotus is a... Not happy that his henchman fell for a fake crystal star. In the meantime, Tech is struggling with whether he should decide to simp for Peach or simp for his boss. I'd personally go for the girl. Tech tells her everything, which of course, the game conveniently cuts all of it out for dramatic storytelling purposes. As Peach tells Mario the news she had just received, uh oh! Grotus kills Tech, and I know to you it may seem like a silly computer, but man, do these writers find a way to make you care about a fictional super computer. Bowser has a little moment with Rockhawk, and this is the part where I call him a fat ass. Chapter 7 starts off in the icy cold far outpost. Enemies in this area predictably use ice-based attacks. This is an excellent opportunity to explain the newest crystal star power we just received, Showstopper, which is basically an instant win button. It's not guaranteed to work, especially on harder enemies, but we'll take what we can get. I ended up dying a handful of times here because our health increases over the game don't keep pace with how powerful certain enemy attacks are. When we get to town, we're instructed to find gold Gold Bob and General White to be able to use their cannon to shoot us to the moon. Oh yeah, by the way, the x knots are located on the moon. That's probably kind of important to establish. Gold Bob is pretty simple, as we just saw him in Poshley Heights, and he gives permission easily. General White, on the other hand, is part of probably one of the most infamous moments where the game decides to throw you on a half-hour fetch quest of going to one location, the resident saying, he was just here, and again, and again. But with a quick cut, boom, I found him. After waking up from his thousand year slumber. <laughs> See what I did there? We get in his rocket and launch ourselves to the moon. The moon houses Grotus's base, which it's cool to infiltrate a section of the game we've seen a lot already. We immediately jump into event battle territory with a couple of elite x knots They're just x knots but they have more health and do more damage. x knots are most of the battles going forward. How fitting, I know. We're fighting x knots at the x knots base. There's a new Yucks variant known as the Cross Yuck which spawns small mini yucks to create a protective barrier around itself. Not too much of an issue, especially with partners like Vivian who can hit all enemies with fiery jinx. But boy are they still annoying to deal with, evident by, you know, the game over. More puzzles. This place is really elaborate for a secret society. Where'd they get all this money to fund the construction of this place? It's money laundering, isn't it? Lord Crump corners us and describes how he's been waiting for us. Huh, waiting for us. Then how about you stop making your base a labyrinth? He introduces us to the Magnus Von Grapple 2.0. And you gotta love the attention to detail and putting a giant 2 on his robot. Chapter 7's final boss presents a much harder experience than when we encountered the original Magnus Von Grapple. The main problem with this boss is that a lot of the attacks are toward Mario and his partner. He'll shoot things at Mario, stomp his feet into Mario. There were many times where I was able to get a handful of super guards, which I usually describe as luck, but it technically is all skill. I'm just that good, guys. Midway through the fight, he'll shoot out his arms and they do 18 damage apiece. Only, you know, that's not that much. Taking them out isn't too bad, but these damage counts are getting high. Near the end of the fight, Lord Crump took notes from Cortez, who took notes from Hooktail, and decided to take part of the audience and shoot Shoot them back at us! And this is essentially an instant game over. It happens too fast to Super Guard, and there are just too many audience members used to survive. The next time
time around, I put a partner in front who acted as a meat shield. Sorry, Bobbery. But with enough persistence and power bounce and power lift combos, Magnus Von Grapple 2.0 goes down. We received the seventh and final crystal star, which means we can enter the thousand year door. But before that, we have to check up on Grotus. Oh, nope, the game wants to skip that and instead we go watch Goofy Bowser shenanigans. Bowser breaks into the museum to find that the display crystal star isn't the real crystal star. He gets kind of mad. A Paragoomba also breaks into the museum, and I think it's funny he peacefully rests on the penguin Sherlock Holmes' head. He informs Bowser that Mario is headed to the Thousand Year Door, and it's a mad race to see who can get to the treasure first. We have a final moment with Tech where he sacrifices himself to get Mario out of there and save Peach. See, the simping was the right call. With heading down to the Thousand Year Door, all the stars' power are used to open the door, and we can now begin Begin the final and most challenging chapter. Welcome to the Palace of Shadow. Yeah, it's cool looking. I won't go into the regular battles or hub world quests as much because boy do we have a lot to go over. Swoopula is a variant of the Swoopers. They suck as much health as they attack for. They suck! Dry bones are officially present and are much more of a threat, as just like the dull bones before, they'll rise back up at some point. So taking them out is much more strategic because of their higher health. We have a sort of deja vu moment with a reenactment of Chapter 1's mini boss, Red Bones, except this time, he's Dark Bones. Same structure as the last boss. The funny thing is, I used Showstopper to get rid of the dry bones so I could just focus on Dark Bones, but by pure luck, I took out Dark Dark bones, but not two of the dry bones, I'll take it. The first boss of the Shadow Palace goes down easily. Remember the cannons of Chapter 5? Probably not because I never mentioned them. Yeah, well, they're gold now, I guess. Same with the Sentient Fire. They already did blue and orange, so clearly ugly green was the next logical step. We got whatever the hell this thing is. And we enter a giant room as we encounter a recolored Hooktail. In the process, we accidentally reveal we killed Hooktail, who was his younger sister. Gloomtail here is more of an actual boss, unlike the last fight. He's Hooktail on steroids, which is seen through his Poison Breath attack, which deals 17 damage and also does more damage for nine turns. Two of those attacks are indeed enough to kill me just like that. If he doesn't use his poison attack, he may just jump and create a shockwave doing 21 damage. Clockout was the answer and allowed me to use power lift and get some early hits in without being knocked out in two turns. His health goes down shockingly fast thanks to some badges I've been collecting through the adventure that increases Mario's attack power. They use a lot of BP, but it helps to get these bosses his health down as fast as possible, as a couple of hits is enough to take us out. Gloomtail goes down, and we're casually killing a whole family of dragons. We go and solve a series of cryptic puzzles. These are pretty good and quite hard, even going back to them. That is, until we encounter the Shadow Sirens, who reveal we accidentally let them in because Duplis disguises Professor Frankly, and it's fighting time again with a sort of round two for both the Shadow Sirens and Duplis. Their attacks are the same as before, with just improved stats, except Duplis, who literally goes down in one attack. Beldum, when charged up, does 22 attack to both Mario and his partner, as I narrowly avoid an attack from Beldum because one of my badges equipped. Even though there's a lot of them, because of all their relatively low health, we can knock them down one by one for a nice victory. Not walking too much farther, we enter a nice room, and when you see the save and heal box, you know it's boss time. As the camera turns, oh my god, it's Computer Man. You see, Grotus explains that he gave up collecting all all the crystal stars and instead let us open the door as he could get inside. How he got to the room we're in right now before me is beyond me and we enter the Grotus fight. Damn it! Grotus doesn't have a lot of health, but Gorsh Mick does he have a lot of tricks up his sleeve. For one, he'll create little Grotus X's around him. When there's four of them, they'll make a shield around him. But the number of Grotus X's also will increase his defense by however many are alive. Vivian's fiery jinx handles them nicely, but it limits how often we can pull out other partners and use them because he constantly pulls them out. Grotus then has both a lightning and fire attack, which hit both Mario and his partner, and 
of course, since we're late in the game, they do an incredible amount of damage. He's got more magic-based attacks, such as countering direct attacks, becoming dodgy, trying to stun me, which somehow I blocked despite there being no visual cue. Thankfully, the Palace of Shadow is filled with useful healing items, which is how our health can be maintained throughout this fight. The amount of attacks Scrotus has is nerve-wracking. There's just a lot to keep track of. But still, his relatively low health makes him go down. Scrotus is like, hmm, did you know Peach was behind us the whole time? He zaps us, and remember when I called Bowser a fat ass? Well, it comes into play right... Now, Bowser is like, WTF Mario, you're here? Peach is here? Great, I will fight you, right now. Do you see the problem? You fight Bowser directly after the Grotus fight, which immediately puts us at a disadvantage of not having full stats. And spoiler alert, if you do happen to die, which I definitely did, you had to fight Grotus again. This Bowser fight poses quite a threat with both Bowser and Kami attacking. Bowser's attacks aren't too bad. He'll breathe fire, do a bite, do a jump, most of which are pretty easy to super guard. Cammy acts more as a support role with her spells. She'll heal Bowser and do her own attacks. These bosses usually only have one to focus on, but the early game here is crucial to not screw up. The nice thing about Cammy is her lack of defense, so taking her out isn't that hard. And we'll focus on her since she acts more as a supporting role. While it's easy to take out Cammy fast, Bowser is a slower grind because of his spikes. Jumping isn't an option, so we have to resort to other moves, which means goodbye power bounce and multi bonk. It just drags out this fight even longer, and we already used a fair bit of healing items on Grotus, so we're scraping by here. I'd also like to point out that I probably had some of the worst stage luck. In one of my runs, I became frozen, and then I got confused, and then the audience fell asleep, and then I got dizzy while still being confused. Then Abu decided to make Bowser invisible. I lost. This is a rough fight, but I mean, I won eventually, the show must go on. We defeat them and oh wait, Grotus is taking Peach away. I guess even though we beat him, he doesn't actually die. So Grotus says some dramatic sentences and he can just change all the candles with a stroke of his staff. All right, I love Mario games part two. And then holy shit, darkness takes over the world. It's Jover. Peach becomes possessed as the Shadow Queen, and she just kills Grotus. Okay. And so it is finally time to tackle the Shadow Queen. The Shadow Queen has a pretty chill start. Well, chill is relative, considering she can send lightning strikes that do 15 damage. The Shadow Queen goes back and forth from her Peach form to her Demon form. And spoiler alert, this is one of those fights where when they get to their final form, they can't be harmed. Yeah, so the Shadow Queen can't be hurt, but it isn't until the spirit and kind words of everyone from all the locations you visited that breaks the invincibility barrier around the Shadow Queen. Guys, it's convenient for the plot. And so, the true battle begins. The tricky thing about the Shadow Queen is her three hands. It would be one thing if she herself did upwards of 15 to 20 damage, but her and her two arms do. She basically gets three attacking turns is what I mean. And because of that, she can kill us really, really fast. And since we just had two hard bosses right before this, we've burned through all of our healing items. So we've just gotta make this a perfect run. The winning run had a fair bit of luck, but we can also use how this fight is structured to our advantage. You start off with no audience, but you are guaranteed to roll three shines once you attack a couple of times. This means we can basically take as much damage and burn through as much FP as we want early on. The Shadow Queen cycles between having two hands and a horde of hands. Having a horde is much better for our strategy. Trying to use Clock Out is a lot easier with only two targets instead of three, since the chances are low of it actually working. Having two entities in battle instead of three makes this fight much easier. In a handful of runs, Clock Out may only work on one hand or just the Queen herself, which still leads to death. So having both the Queen and her hands frozen for three three turns is huge. The real beauty was having Merly give us an attack power boost in addition to the attack power boost from Power Lift. By the time she was unfrozen, it didn't matter that she almost killed us. Her health was so low, it was enough to kill her for good and to finish the boss. And with that, the Shadow Queen goes down and Peach is all fine. She's just sleeping. How romantical. After it's all said and done, we find ourselves saying one last goodbye to our crew. We sail back to the Mushroom King Kingdom, only for Peach to come by Mario's house the next day and say she found another treasure map.
That concludes Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door! This was a fun experience, playing the game but with a new challenge. I will point out that there is some post-game content, most notably the Pit of 100 Trials. It's exactly what you think it is, a gauntlet of 100 enemies that progressively gets harder and culminates in a final secret boss. Guys, it's just a Hooktail reskin. And for the record, I beat him. I didn't bother going over it since a, this video is long enough, and B, it's really just a lot of the same enemies and strategies I use over and over again. So with that, thank you for watching this far, and I'll see you all in the next video.